Thank you so much for such an exciting presentation. Actually, not only one, but three. When it goes to three, meaning many, right? It's much more than plural. It's multiple. It's a multitude. It's really this centrality of this world that is looking into no centers anymore. So I think it's really interesting. We are in an incredible kind of turbulence moment. Having, you know, Sonia, Kamini, and Sepp to present their uh, wonderful um, visions and also all this kind of incredible attempts to try to not only implement these visions, but also struggle to make the visions uh, relevant in their localities and also in the world. I think there's tension between cultural diversity, historical diversity, and the promise of future uh, or present and future technologies are really becoming an a incredibly important question of existence today. So this race of uh, you know, awareness of the impact of technology and the tension between this and, and the geographic, geopolitical, and cultural backgrounds are really uh, something that um, I think through these three presentations we see, you know, um, not only it's a necessity to think about, but also a foundation of collaboration, as oh. you know, they all emphasize how to collaborate between this uh, incredibly diverse uh, conditions mm -hmm. regarding to not only the colonial, post colonial, post uh, globalizing uh, context, but also. Um, the uh, different understandings of technology, and that actually we talk about you know technology very often we talk about now digital AI and so on, but behind this actually there's some very basic, very primitive technologies and some very you know rich um, kind of uh, developments of from those first steps towards a multi -orient orientations. And that is really something that created the complexity of things that probably when we think about the AI, it's not exactly uh, what the AI still can, I mean, can answer to uh, these questions today. But as you know, our friend Phil is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's checking on the, <laughs> on the chat boards um, <laughs> what you know, all these things mean. But I, I'm sure that the answers are still here, not on the iPhone yet. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> saying all this, I wanted to really understand that, you know, three of you, how you will em envision a kind of common discourses, a common ground of debates that would generate the so-called uh, collaboration that risks to be incredibly uncontrollable or too much closed. So. What's the question? That's, that's the question. What's your you know, vision about what is possible to come together and rethink cultural institutions based on these conditions? Oh, yeah, I've got the thing. Sorry. That's cool. I keep forgetting this. I should, um, Don't ask me to run any concert. I, I think it's the shared language piece is really key. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been particularly hard because it's been seen as something that other people do. Mm. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's one of the key parts is having a shared language, uh, but understanding that we might have sh different shared, different purposes that are not yet shared and we need to find commonality across those two, certainly. In, in doing a project over the last two, two years with people from the performing arts particularly, um, it's been interesting to see how it's taken quite a while for us to come to finding where our institutional forms do, in, do intersect. And I think that finding that intersection, I think, with MAP, I think it's really interesting. I think, you know, well, actually all three of our institutions don't uh, really do collapse that divide between cap, capital A art and lowercase c cult, 
culture, yeah. and that creates new opportunities. We need to go with that rather than trying to differentiate the fields as much. I'm, I'm not sure yet. I agree with you absolutely because in India, for example, all the arts are so deeply interconnected. For example, if you look at a, a, pat a patwa artist, now he paints a scroll, but he carries that scroll with him through different villages, uh, singing that story, dancing it, performing. So he can't just be one thing. He has to be multiple things. And that was how art evolved in India. And then, of course, when we had the British come in, it was, oh, no, either you have to be a singer or a dancer or a... <laughs> so, um, so, so we're really looking at how do we bring back those connections into the space? Um, so for us, um, yeah, we are really working. We see MAP as a space that connects all of these. Uh, for example, um, in our first digital festival that we had online called Art is Life, uh, we, we looked at the intersection of music and the visual arts. For example, how do you um, how do you use the power of music um, to to interact with another uh, with another form of art? And uh, in fact, we had this this little um, exhibition called Sights and Sounds, where we encouraged uh, people to look at a work. Usually, okay, usually you approach a work, a work of visual art by looking at it. We said now, listen to the painting, use another sense that you normally would not use. And so we set each music, uh, we set each painting to a bit of music, to look at it from a completely different perspective and approach it from a way that you would not normally do. And, and that seems to have worked very well. It was quite popular. So I, I really feel it's important for us to be looking at this collaborative uh, format across um, different kinds of mediums and genres. Yes, I couldn't agree more because the, tra the Togolese traditional storytellers they, they write, I mean, they tell story that so they know how to, to tell, they, they know the words, but they also sing and dance, so it's for them totally natural. They don't de define themselves as singers, dancers, or storytellers. They just say, well, we are artists. storytellers, griots, artists, so it, it, it would be, be very consistent to, to use that in the museum space, that mm -hmm. type of collaborations and multidisciplinary approach instead of saying this, this, and this. It doesn't, I think that given one of the words, one of the key words of our conversations with the tech industry was also the word fluent. And that kind of fluidity and fluency correspond also to the world of today. Mm -hmm. And is very consistent with this world. Yeah, I think this is a very, very, very important notion about uh, um, fluidity, fluence, and transformation. It leads to a transformation, uh, not only the physical sign, uh, f form of, of the objects, the things from, you know, and, but really it's about the institutional structure that I think it comes here, uh, the notion of power, right? Power actually has to do about how to build in infrastructure and impose this infrastructure, infrastructure on each one's life and to create cat catalogs, categ categories, hierarchies, and operation modes, etc. Right. So all this um, facing the possibility of this openness of transitional, uh, it's kind of perpetuate uh, permanent transitions that we try to live in, live with, um, and we have to re envision the structure of the institutions, hence the power relationship. So being museum directors, how do you see your roles as museum directors? Being a powerful person, not to talk about power of art or power of museums and so on. I mean, I guess for me, it's sort of um, having a more rhizomatic approach to um, uh, or organizational stru structure and focusing on um, what we want the institution to have an effect in the world on. So having a sort of a, you know, we, we're just going through our new uh, strategic plan development at the moment and we, we're getting rid of all the things about saying uh, we are bringing X to Y or we have the best whatever and it's more about, you know, we're actually describing ourselves as a hub that works with communities uh, and communities with us. Um, and sort of trying to make that divide 
differentiate in the lang language as well. Um, but it's challenging. And in fact, the greatest resistance to that trans trans transformation are the structures of a capital A art world that who, who are looking for or what I what, what I see as looking for certainty rather than um, fluidity, you know, and that that's one of the things I think uh, the, the fields we work in need to need to ch need to want to change as well, and I think we can model the three of us can certainly model alternative ways of working. But the three of us are not the major art in institutions in the world that define what capital A art is. Well, it could be. It could be. Potentially, well, in the future, you future, guys might be you know, so, the yeah. next. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but Tom, you know, may, maybe the next match is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I honestly think we cannot assume that position of, of power anymore. It makes us just look silly and irrelevant uh, in today's context because. Um, in spite of the scholarship and learning that museum professionals bring uh, to the space, there is a huge amount of knowledge that resides within the community. That's right. Yeah? So how are you going to tap into it? it it's, it's a, I, I look at it as a relationship of exchange. How, for example, in India, you have all these uh, communities that actually use the objects that we place in our museum. They've created them. They use them. They have great knowledge about them. So um, I, I see it as, as a, a, a relationship of, of, of exchange where it, it's an equal relationship. And in fact, um, on all the objects that map, um, even when they're online, we always add a line saying, if you have any information about this object that you'd like to add, or you find there is any information that is inaccurate, please write into us. Because I think this is a process. It's not that we get everything right and, and, and knowledge is evolving. People are constantly adding to something. Something which had a certain position a few years ago may not have that, that same position a few years down the line. So I think it's just important to be able to open yes. to changing positions. Yeah. Yes, and I think that having a position of power is, is no longer what is expected from us. And we have to learn also from the local communities. Uh, for instance, um, I learned when, I, when I, I was working with a mason for the transformation of a place, I learned so much. One of the masons was also a traditional healer. So we learned with him and the architect were discussing the fact that, well, he knows so much. And this traditional field of traditional healers, the or inhabitants of er, several areas of the city, they, they have of even the traditional communities, when you discuss with them for the exhibition that we did, Togo of the Kings, we learned a lot from them. So of course, and uh, of course, when you discuss with university scholars, they, are, they, they say, well, we are the one who have the knowledge. Um, not all of them are willing to share it, but when they saw the exhibitions and saw the result of it and discussed with them, they, they understood that they have more to share than they, they would have expected. And I think that a museum should be an, 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 an enabler for gatherings, of, for having people from various horizons to be able to discuss and meet. Yeah. So we are, we, are really, we are really in a humble position of not know, knowing and learning from the others as well. I, I think that, it's, that your statement on your website would have been really radical 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I, remember, I remember when the Brooklyn Museum in 2005, six put that sort of stuff up and we, we copied that at the powerhouse a couple of weeks later. It really did create an interesting friction. So it's really fascinating to see how fast those things have changed, although we also feel it's really slow. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, you know, my museum, which, which does curate film and recommend games, you know, we, we, we have people coming to us and saying, well, what should my children play? I don't like all these violent uh, video yeah. games. What sort of video games do you recommend we should play? And that opens up a dialogue. So I don't think we can, the power doesn't dissipate, but the relationship with power change, 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 changes. Similarly with film, so we, you know, within the curatorial teams, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build this notion of open curation where, where the curators are, are showing, showing, showing that they're working, much like that view, view source model of the web, where you could look at someone else's work. So, so that sort of sense of the transparency of curation 
so that the reasons that people, the reasons that their, their curators have chosen things are not assumed, but shown. Mm -hmm. So then they become contest, um, contest, uh, contestable by the, uh, by the community, but it doesn't also water down that sense of ex expertise and deep knowledge that comes from experience. Mm -hmm. So I do think we need to be careful that in this world where ex expertise has been explicitly removed mm. as part of a, a right-wing project to to raise, basically move knowledge. away from democracy, mm. you know, we, we need to be careful that we don't accidentally fall into that. Mm. Experts are super important. I, I, I want to get vaccinated by, by people who have done research, right? And so, <laughs> you know, like I really do. <laughs> but it's the, contest, the contestability of that is important. That, that, that there, there's, a, there's a transparency of, of, of why we should trust people rather, rather than you should trust people just because they work in a museum. museum. You know, that, they're that's, the director, yeah. that's that piece that I think is important. Absolutely. Yeah, just Great. Um, thank you. And I think it's time to actually turn to the audience because actually here there are two empty seats, <laughs> which is usually the, the power centre. Right? You guys should be sitting here. So but I just find out there are two seats. Which one is occupied by an iPhone and, a, and some old papers, too. You know, yesterday I, we were visiting all these tech companies. And we noticed that nobody, the only paper that exists is a toilet papers. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so um, now, you know, uh, it's time for you to fill up these positions. I think it's really important that. You know, according to the logic that we try to promote here, we try to put ourselves in the, into the dirty water to really to test yeah. um, when the institutions are re cheating from you know the central power position, the public takes over. Of course, you are all directors and you know experts and so on. So it's not so uh, innocent neither, but. Um, it's important that your voice can be brought in to fill up these two seats and merge with theirs. So please. Um, whoever organized this by way of bringing a, a global uh, a, a level of participation uh, feels so essential. And it's so lovely to see all of you coming uh, from you know places way outside of the United States, it's especially nice to see Seb, who I, I think for many people in this room uh, is 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 sort of appreciated as something of a traveling monk who who brings these practices <laughs> to various and different places, and we all follow. Uh, uh, and indeed, also thanks, you came out about 20 years ago to the Bay Area and gave a really important presentation at Yerba Buena that actually launched almost all the digital programs in the museums in San Francisco where they didn't exist before. And you were so persuasive that basically following that, everybody moved headlong into moving into digital. Um, it, it's really nice to be here and it's lovely to see these faces and thank you so much. Um, uh, I'd love to, to hear again from Seb um, uh, the name of the artist uh, that he was profiling toward the end of the presentation, which begins to hint at the idea that, that perhaps we're not so much thinking about museums of tomorrow, but the museums of our past. Uh, and, and, and whether there's now a kind of fluency in digital uh, and a related sort of suspicion in a way, a little bit of these decentralizations where we're all starting to explore themes that I might describe as spirituality uh, or maybe even getting back to sort of more uh, uh, almost uh, you know, to use a positive term, primitive understandings of the human, that, that we're multidimensional, that, that there's no way to actually categorize separately. Um, I'm wondering if you could each speak a little bit to that uh, potential kind of turn to sort of understanding the lessons of our past, being slightly su suspicious of our futures, and, and maybe even a hinting toward a spirituality that's necessary in our practice. Um, that artist is Joel kind of Sherwood Spring. I'll share the link. Um, that work was commissioned for a First Nations curated, First, First Nations only exhibition, uh, which was free, that we mount, mount, mounted between December and March uh, called How I See It, uh, Black Art and Film. Um, I, 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 I think there's, there's, there's two things going on. One of them is a really positive shift to more, this more fluid uh, and multi multi-dimensional way of seeing cult, cult, culture and life. Um, and the other one is a conservative retreat to the ways of the old, which I, I worry we can see 
history as being something we want to bring back, we can't. And I think that's, that's a real, really interesting tension that I think on, on all vectors of polit politics, there is a conservatism in reimagining worlds that, didn't, that can no longer exist as a way of avoiding agency in the future. Mm. And there is an important, how do we understand from that? And I think as a, as a, as a migrant to, Aust to Australia and the child of a, a multiracial child of a, ref um, I'm a, ref I'm a refugee, that sort of sense of identity, identity purity is a very reactionary, conservative thing. And I'm very cautious of any uh, moves towards that. So, um, so there are many things we can learn from each other, but I think it's really important to move into the future with aid, aid, agency and collective action where we learn from each other rather than divide by identity, which I do see in some of the spiritual re reawakenings and Cali California, of course, being a home of, uh, you know, the um, adoption of pra practices ex um, extracted perhaps from other parts of the world. So it would be very, so it, it's, a, it's a really, it's just, I don't know, it's complicated, right? <laughs> I love the poetry you brought to your question, but uh, I don't know. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a country where we're living where people say, why would I go to a museum? I mean, they're just dead objects there. So the challenge is really to um, help people understand why this object, the whole idea of storytelling and why this object is relevant to you now. Um, why would, um, say, I remember seeing this old pot and everyone looked at a black cooking pot. Uh, in the exhibition, and, and they were saying, black cooking pot. But this was a pot that was over a thousand years old and had been taken by a, a tradesman uh, traveling from Gujarat in India to Iran and was found there. But obviously, a terracotta pot, which could have broken easily, but which it was some source of comfort to him to create his own food in an alien environment and that he traveled with everywhere. So these are the stories and, and why, you know, the idea of food and how it is comforting to you and how it binds you uh, together through cultures. And, and you can see that in the pandemic, how food, everyone was cooking and baking and whatnot. So the whole idea of what brings us together and, and, and gets, us, um, gets us to connect with each other and brings us sources of comfort. So I think these are the important things to share with, uh, with people um, in, in, in the work that we do. Yes. It's I agree. It's about exchange, communities, then uh, more than nostalgia of the past. Mm. Uh, we're trying to build communities that will also contribute to creating the future. And even when you do an exhibition with uh, old objects, the old objects always resonate for us now and new and changed. And we are speaking about spirituality and poetry. It's also for the, the visitors. Uh, according to their mentality of the work of the artist to have that kind of dialogues. Mm. So, Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I had a question I was dying to ask and then Hu Hanru said we had to come up there and sit on that seat. <laughs> and, then <I> was, <laughs> and then I was really struggling with the power of uh, voicing and institutional voice and whatnot, but um, just to give a little intro, my name is Christine Park. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I work for Samsung uh, America, and I work on a, pro a product called the Samsung Art TV. It's a TV that when it's off, or it, when it's on, it's TV. When it's off, it turns into artwork. I come to Samsung quite recently by way of Christie San Francisco and the Asian Art Museum. So this tech versus art is a new um, area for me as well. But the dying question I had, and the one that I struggle with most right now, I would love to bring museums and art through the TV into the homes of many. I am having the most difficulty with licensing issues with <laughs> images. And I would like to hear a little bit more about um, your thoughts on how to get over hurdles with licensing so that we can share art with more people through technology. 
Licensing, oh my God, is there an answer to that? <laughs> well, Seth, maybe you have a collection. Of, uh, all my uh, collections in copyright, so yeah. I, I so feel your pain. How, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm not trying to make a commercial product out of my works. I think that's where the real challenges will lie, and I think licensing is uh, absolutely critical for artists to get paid. Um, I think the the more existential challenge with the art kind of TV and, and its other, and um, I have in my house one of the predecessors of that, uh, which was actually a kick, Kickstarter project. And it was kind of interesting to sort of see what, how, what happens when those images are recontextualized recontext, recontext, recontext as a screensaver. Effectively a beautiful TV screensaver. Um, elegantly done in the art kind of TV's case, so it looks like an art artwork. But it, but it does bring, for a lot of museums, with those collections, uh, an, an interesting challenge in the relationship with the artist. So, um, you know, we, we have video artworks in, in our collection, included, I mean, included in Joel's. I would love to put Joel's work up on our website, um, but because it's a dual screen work, for the most part, uh, we, can't, we don't feel we can rep replicate it to the degree that the artist would want. Um, which keeps it off the internet and keeps it off the, the TV, even if Joel did want to have it appear in people's homes. Um, but the sort of notion of people sitting with the work for a long period of time and engaging with it is different to being wallpaper in someone's house. And I think there's, a, there's an existential question for us around that. Um, and there's plenty of stuff that's now out of, out of copyright, but that's also being trained, that's the training fodder for the, gen the generative AI tools, which we have mixed feelings about too. So I think there is no easy answer, but, but IP will be, well, is really the hot topic of now and possi possibly the next decade as we try to figure this out, as we try to figure out ac access and, and context and framing. And museums, art, 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 art museums are context and framing, if anything, right? So. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that, that perhaps art, art museums are the best people to work through that with a tech company around this stuff rather than being the, just the source of the content. You would love for your digital exhibitions to have more light. Yeah, I think we all in this room would, or certainly all of us would. It's almost time for lunch, but we're going to take one last question. We okay, have so school. many questions. Just a moment. We'll take one last question for now. I just wanted to invite you, if you scan this QR code, you can submit a question um, via text, and I'll be vetting those and feeding them in for the round table that's longer at the end of the program, at the end of the day. So I know that there were a lot of questions we didn't get to this morning, so I'd encourage you to submit this way, and then we'll get to as many as we can for the round table at the end of the day. Thank you. Oh, Sorry. Uh, well, that's a please. lot of pressure to have a microphone. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I want, I want to just you, hand Maria. it back now. Um, uh, thank you all for great presentations. Um, there was a moment at the round table. I'm Chad Kerver. I'm the Contemporary Jewish Museum. From the Contemporary Jewish Museum. I am not the museum. I am one. Um, the question is this. At the, at the round table at the end of the day on Monday, there was this brief moment where uh, 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 just a tiny excursus, like, are we going to question the validity of the museum model thinking that the ultimate goal of all of our activities is to get a human being in front of a physical artwork? And there was this kind of ripe pause. And everybody went, oh, no, 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 no. I think, and I think it was a little bit of a staring into the sun moment for us, right? Because all of us who are in the museum space believe, I think most of us believe, that we should get a human being in front of a physical object and that there is something rich in that encounter that can't happen any other way. So I'm going to ask this in a really small way to Kamini. Um, you're running a digital museum for a few years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You come to this building. Is there any moment that you said to yourself, I'm not sure I need the building in order to be successful? Or what do you still need from that digital preview that your building can't provide? The single answer to that is no. I, I think there's something so incredibly powerful about a physical space. Um, and I think we have to look at it neither as, it's, it's not an either or. Mm. Uh, to me, it's, this, it's two parts of a whole. There are some things that the digital can provide you, um, like the reach. 
certain kinds of experiences, certain ways of interacting, and, and they will always be valuable. There's so much um, that's wonderful about the, the, the physical space, about actually interacting with an object to be able to stand, to feel, to sense texture, to sense um, color, all of that. I mean, whatever you say, color doesn't look quite the real color it is online. Right. Yeah? So there are so many things that need to be experienced um, physically. And I think um, one way that really tells us is so many of us have, okay, some of us have met online before. But when you meet in person, it, it's, it's quite a different uh, chemistry. Yeah? So um, it's, it's the chemistry. And I, I don't, and, and I don't think that can be recreated in, in, in the digital world. But, but it has its benefits, and let's enjoy them. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, for, for my museum, we, we did go through a very similar thing while we were closed. And I think coming back now af, after the lockdown period of the pan, uh, pan, uh, pandemic and running these big cinemas, we have asked ourselves, what is the purpose of coming to a big cinema to see a, see a, see a film, particularly an art house film? And outside of a film festival context, I would have to say we're still struggling with that. So we have a streaming service now, and we also uh, send people to other ones, um, where the content experience might be at home, but the social experience is in the cinema. And that social <laughs> experience is also the smell of the pop popcorn. It's also the annoying person checking their phone while they're in while the film's playing. It's all the the, the horribleness of the cinema experience as much as it is the, the good part, right? But but it does it did mean that we had to re reframe the curatorial purpose away from just being choosing the best things and talking about them in a post 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 screening conversation into really going, well, what is this going, what, what is the purpose of this? And that quest, questioning of the purpose of the presentation um, is part of that open, open to curation dis discussion, asking the curator to say, why should someone come and see this physically? Mm -hmm. Why should this be in the exhibition? Because now you will have to answer that, that, that question because I could see it on my Samsung art kind of TV on my couch, just as you could see most of the films, play most of the video games. What you won't get, though, is this other thing that we, we need to define and be very trans, transparent about that. So the thing I didn't show was the lens, which is the thing that when you come to my museum, you walk through that Goddess exhibition, for example, and you see, you know, um, um, the Marilyn Monroe dress or the, Bolly, the, the Bollywood post, posters and the films, Parkeza, that mm -hmm. when you go home, you will get the streaming links for that film because the experience in, in the gallery sets up an interest in that inner context. But then actually watching that film is much better at home with your friends and fam family and I would hope a really great curry as well. The food part <laughs> is really important too to making sense of that Film, ex film, ex film experience, and you know, you think about the Bollywood film, ex film experience in a cinema, is very different to when you present that yeah. in a museum where you don't let people bring in their food, you don't let people sing along, you tell people, you know, like it's that kind of going with what it is that makes it different, and I think we've been quite reluctant to foreground the audience, and that's really what it's about. You know, to add to what you said, Seb, when we open the museum, uh, all the activity on our social media handles on our website went up 10 times. So, and I think, Suhania, you said that as well, right? Yep. So, so we, we are seeing how the physical affects or encourages the, the digital or the, or, the other, or the other kind of interaction. Most, most people in the world have never visited a you know, museum, and I think when we met with Amit Sud from Google Arts and Culture, I remember Amit's early con uh, conversations with museums in the 2010s, the very early 2010s. And Amit was saying that most people have never been to the museums or seen these collections and that's why it's important. And I think for a lot of museum people, it was quite a, quite a wake-up call around 
the majority of the world will never come to see the collections of the Met or the MoMA or, you know, the Smithsonian. They just won't. So most people haven't vis visited. And it still remains the great opportunity. The, op the optimism of the 2000s, 1990s and 2000s, there's still a little bit of that that we can harness. It just now need, we have other competitors in that space now. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so now let's have some physical food. Thank you.